Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Erwin Shemrinsky, and I have the thrilling responsibility of being the founding dean of the University of California Irvine School of Law. And this afternoon, I want to introduce you to two very special people. First, I want to introduce you to Mark Robinson. Stand right. Mark is one of the great lawyers, not just here in Southern California, but nationally. He's a graduate of Stanford University, from Loyola Law School. He's a partner of the firm of Robinson and Calcagney and Robinson. He's one of a small group of people who worked for many years to create a law school at the University of California at Irvine. He's been tremendously supportive of our law school. He gave us a million dollar gift that we used for student scholarships. We're going to name the courtroom that will be ready in January next year, the Mark Robinson Courtroom, in his honor to thank him for this gift. And then this December, when we were struggling to put together enough funds that we could offer scholarships to our secondary class, Mark immediately came through and gave us another $400,000 for scholarships. Beyond the financial support, Mark serves as the chair of the Dean's Advisory Commission. He also serves as a member of the campaign cabinet. And he serves as a constant advisor to me and the law school administration on everything that goes into building an outstanding law school. Um, we're just delighted that we our first endowed lecture series named after Mark. This is the first annual, and I hope will be a series of for many years, of the Mark P. Robinson Jr. lecture series. Because I think what Mark's dedicated his career to, access to justice, helping those who have been injured, could not possibly have a better speaker kick off the lecture series than Bert Newborn. Bert is the Inez Milhoff Civil Liberties Professor in New York University. As you may know, yesterday was admitted Students Day for the law school. We brought in the students we've admitted to tell them about our school, hopefully to induce them to decide to come here next year. And I heard many of the students, and the faculty, and the lawyers tell the admitted students but one of the most important things is to find role models. Well, Bert Newborn has been my role model of what I aspire to be as a teacher, a scholar, as an advocate. He's an outstanding teacher. For decades, I've heard students from NYU Law School say he was the very best teacher that they had. As a scholar, he's truly esteemed. He's written countless articles and books. One of his articles, The Myth of Parity, is among the most frequently cited law review articles that's ever been written in the United States. He's a terrific advocate. He spent a few years as the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union. He was the founding legal director of the Brennan Center. Talked today at lunchtime to the faculty about his role as class counsel for the Holocaust-related litigation. But in this brief description of Bert's accomplishments, I don't begin to tell you about what a wonderful person he is. I remember when I was starting out as a law professor and I would go to conferences, most of the fancy law professors, if they talked to me at all, would be looking over my shoulder to see if somebody more important came in the room for their talk to me. I'll never forget when I first met Bert, which was a conference at NYU Law School in the mid-1980s, the amount of time he spent with me, and the paper that I was presenting there was a response to his work because even a little critical of it, he was so unbelievably generous with his time and his attention. Over the years, I've asked him to participate in many conferences, including one each summer. He's never turned down any request that I've made, you know how busy he is. One final story, a couple of months ago, my wife, in her course on the legal professional law school, was teaching a course in Legal Service Corporation versus Vasquez that Bert had argued in the Supreme Court and won it. And Catherine was asking me certain questions about why it was presented to the Supreme Court the way it was. I said, well, you should write Bert and ask him this. She said, well, why would he answer my email? And besides, I'm teaching it tomorrow morning. I said, well, given the time change, at least ask him. And sure enough, by the time she woke up the next morning, there was a long response from Bert answering her questions so she could present the information to the students. So it's a great personal pleasure to introduce the first Mark P. Robinson lecture, Bert Newborn. delightful to be here, uh, and it is a great honor to be the first uh, Mark Robinson lecturer. Um, the beginning of what I am sure will be a long and distinguished uh, lineage. Um, 
Thank you, uh, uh, Dean Chervinsky. Erwin, I'll call you. Um, this is a reciprocating for a, a wonderful speech that Erwin gave on Saturday at NYU. He came to New York to talk about uh, campaign finance reform. And if I've never said no to him, he's never said no to me. Uh, and it's a wonderful relationship. Um, and thinking about Erwin as the dean here, uh, as the founding dean uh, of uh, a new and uh, wonderfully hopeful uh, law school, uh, made me think of the memo that I wrote uh, when I retired as national legal director of the ACLU. I was national legal director of the ACLU during the Reagan years, and it was a demanding and a difficult time. Um, and I left after six and a half years to go back to NYU, and I wrote a memo saying what I'd learned as the administrator of a large legal program during that period. And I said, I learned that there are three ways to get things done. Um, and the three ways to get things done are greed, fear, and sex. Um, the, um, uh, I said, anybody who knows me, uh, who knows the ACLU budget, knows that I had very, very little um, capacity to use greed to induce anybody to do anything. We had no money and there was no way to do it. Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I couldn't use fear because they know that I never follow through with any threat. Um, I said, and that leaves the fact that I now leave office an exhausted man. <laughs> Um, now, of course, I meant <laughs> for people to understand that sex was a metaphor for charisma. Uh, because that's the only, the only way uh, that you could lead an institution, uh, a nonprofit institution, a great intellectual nonprofit institution, is through charismatic leadership. And it's why you could not have a better team than early showers. Uh, there is no body in functioning in a legal academia today. Uh, that has the mixture of moral fervor, uh, intellectual and analytical commitment, um, and absolute commitment to the job. I think he works 26 hours every single day. Um, and you put those things together, and you have a leader that people follow. And they follow not because of fear, not because of greed, and for Irwin's sake, I hope, not because of sex, uh, <laughs> but because of, uh, charism because of the charismatic way. Uh, in which he an institution. So it's, it's an honor to, uh, uh, to help him launch the law school. Um, Mark Robinson uh, is a sort of um, legend in the uh, legal world as one of the most successful uh, lawyers of his time. Uh, and I've admired him for many years. Uh, it is a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing, to help launch a new law school that's committed to academic excellence and to social justice. Uh, and, and that is no small thing to do that. And so thank you, Mark. It is a wonderful thing to do that. Um, so um, this is an occasion, of some, in some sense, uh, for um, retrospection. Um, I got an email from West um, um, not too long ago informing me that they had just published the 500th case in which I had been named counsel. Uh, I don't know whether I'd get a gold watch because of it, but they just thought that they'd let me know. And I said, look, if I've got 500 cases, then I really want to start looking backwards a little bit and doing a little introspection uh, about my cases. And so this lecture is, provides me with the opportunity to begin that. Um, and the introspection that I want to start with is an introspection about a line of cases that I've worked most of my professional career on. And that's the cases that attempted to use the courts to help reform American democracy, to make it better and easier for people to be able to vote, to run for office, and to have fair, genuinely representative uh, government um, at the legislative and executive levels. Now, I want to begin by artificially recreating a dialogue that must have taken place 48 years ago uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, I don't have any evidence that the dialogue actually occurred, but what I see are statements in three opinions by the justices at that point that tell me that they were talking about this behind the scenes. And so let me try to reconstruct the dialogue. And it's a dialogue between and among three of our greatest justices, Felix Frankfurter, uh, William Brennan, and John Marshall Harlan. And it is at the dawn of the Supreme Court's entry into the democracy business. Prior to 1962, American courts, apart from 
lukewarm enforcement of the 15th Amendment's ban on racial discrimination in voting really took a hands-off position to democracy, claiming that it was a political question and that it was something that the people should resolve, not the courts. 1962, Baker versus Carr, the one person, one vote case, is the case that launched the Supreme Court into the democracy business almost full time for the next 48 years. And so here's the dialogue that must have taken place. Felix Frankfurter says to his brethren, you will rue the day, you will rue the day that you allow black robed um, um, amateur political scientists to draw the contours of American democracy. Judges have no expertise in political science. There's nothing in the Constitution that tells them what theory of democracy they should adopt. Uh, and unable to reach any judgment about a theory of democracy, um, they will risk creating a democracy that is much worse than the democracy that the people would create if you left them alone to do it. And so Frankfurt is said, in, a, in apocalyptic terms, in a half century, when you look at your handiwork, you will rue this day. I was in law school when that decision came down, um, uh, and I remember laughing at him, thinking to myself how clearly wrong he was, how afraid he was of committing the judiciary uh, to the business of fixing democracy. I was particularly persuaded that he was wrong because he was immediately answered by William Brennan writing for the majority. Brennan, in what was to the end, um, the case that he said was the single most important case he had ever decided, and the case that he was proudest of, was Baker versus Carr. Um, and he said, look, Felix, we don't need a theory of democracy. I don't have to launch American judges on some sort of political science quest. I already have a theory. Um, and it's not even a theory. I have a text. The 14th Amendment says that no person shall be denied equal protection of the laws. Um, and therefore, using equality as my, as my lever, as my lodestar, I will sail this ship in a way that will reform American democracy without asking an American judge to make any decisions about the theory of democracy. Because all I'm going to ask them to do is to enforce equality and enforce it vigorously. And then the third person pipes up, and it's John Marshall Harlan, um, who is a little forgotten these days. But one ought to remember him as the person that launched American judicial um, uh, thinking toward Roe versus Wade. Um, it was John Harlan's opinion in Poe versus Ullman in the 1940s that recognized the substantive due process to privacy uh, in the context of contraception. And is the opinion that eventually ripened uh, into Roe versus Wade. And so Harlan is in the background. Uh, you know, he's the, the, two big, the two big guns are always Frankfurter and Brennan, and they're sniping at each other. And Harlan pipes up from the background. And he says, wait a minute, I'm listening to you, and here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that Justice Brennan is going to win this argument. And we're going to think that equality, as some sort of formal rule, is sufficient to fix democracy. And I get nervous, Harlan said, whenever we use formal rules, because I'm afraid that what we're going to do is degenerate into a set of formal equality rules and lose sight of the substantive workings of democracy. And so we're going to wind up with rules that are fine, they're all formal and they're correct. Um, uh, but when you put them together, they result in a bad democracy because nobody's watching the real issue, which is how the democracy functions in response to those formal rules. He said, be careful that you don't try substance out just because you're dealing with formality. And he looks better in the eye and says, I know what you're doing, Bill. You're, you're, you're telling Felix that we don't have to adopt a theory of democracy because we have a formal uh, uh, set of norms that we can use, uh, equality norms. I'm telling you, you're launching us on a dangerous prospect where the first generation is going to be fine. You'll get one person, one vote, and you'll knock out the state legislatures that are overrepresenting rural areas and underrepresenting urban areas where the black voter lives. We'll knock that out easily on this. But what are we going to do later? When, we, when all we have is formality and we don't have a theory. Well, it's now a half century later, 50 years, uh, actually 48 years since the, uh, since the exchange, 47 years since Harlan piping up in his descent in Gray versus Sanders. Um, so who's right? 
We now have the ability to take a look at a half century of Supreme Court working with democracy to ask who's right. I'm going to call Frankfurter to the stand first, and I'm going to ask him what he thinks. And Frankfurter is going to look out at you, and he's going to say, could anybody, and well, he will say this about anything that he ever did, but he will say this with particular passion here, could anybody be more right than I was? <laughs> um, um, uh, I was absolutely right um, in this situation. Let me, let me look at the evidence. Exhibit one, Bush v. Gore. Uh, exhibit one, Bush v. Gore, where five members of the Supreme Court simply canceled the 2000 presidential election and decided to announce that the winner uh, just happened to be the person from their political party. What could be worse? He said, how, if we wrote a nightmare scenario about how the judiciary would interact with the democratic process, we couldn't have got it worse than that. <coughs> Exhibit two, Citizens United, which was decided just a few weeks ago, um, in which the Supreme Court held that corporations were persons that were endowed with a spark of the creator, and therefore should be allowed to speak on the same terms that you and I speak. Um, that corporations are just part of the process that generates information, and flesh and blood, blood people generate information, corporations generate information, and they all have the same protection, so that corporations can dump vast amounts of money from their corporate treasury into election campaigns three and four days before the vote, drown out all the countervailing voices, um, and somehow the First Amendment has worked, uh, and we now have democracy. Frankfurter would stand back and say, if you have to imagine a democracy where five judges cancel the presidential election, and where corporations literally drown out all conflicting voices on the eve of the election, what kind of democracy have you built? Could the people have done worse? And he would say they could not have done worse. They could not have built a more vulnerable or a worse democracy. And he said, before I sit down, let me add a couple of other things. There are four, the four horsemen that I know, the four horsemen of the, of the apocalypse of any democracy, the four horsemen, the four problems with any democracy are race, money, incumbency, and undue partisanship. And Frankfurter would say, on every one of those grounds, the courts have failed. The courts have failed abysmally in race. In Shaw versus Reno, they, the courts have said that the majority, even when it wants to, cannot help the victims of, 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 of hundreds of years of racial discrimination and the allocation of political power in this society. They can't help them by tilting the playing field toward them a little bit to help them get the uh, power back. That's a violation of formal equality, uh, even though it would be great substantive democracy. Money, could we have done worse than the Supreme Court did in both Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United? Could we have built a democracy more vulnerable to being auctioned off to the highest bidder, which is what we have now? The Supreme Court's model says that you can regulate contributions, but you can't regulate expenditures. Now, any economist will tell you that any model that says that the input of money into it can be regulated, but the output outflow can't, is creating a, a, a model for a black market. What we've done, inadvertently, is to literally replicate the nation's drug policies in our, in our, cam in our campaign policy. There is a an effort at interdicting supply, there is no effort to deal with demand, and so what you have is a vacuum that sucks the money in from somewhere, and it turns out now it sucks it in from corporate treasuries. So he could not have done worse on that. Um, he said, how about incumbency and um, partisanship? Well, the Supreme Court has announced it's okay to favor incumbents. It's okay to draw to gerrymander districts to favor incumbents because that gets us stability. But it's not okay to, to gerrymander districts to help black voters that have been left out of the process for the last 180 years. And then finally they said, and when we get partisan gerrymandering, where the two parties just carve up everything 
so that nothing is really a, 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 a eligible to be voted on on election day because everybody wins by a landslide because you've already drawn the district, so they're not competitive. The court said, oh, sorry, there's nothing we can do about that. That's a political question. So Frankfurter would say, how can we have worse? They won't do anything about partisanship. They won't do anything about incumbency. They were terrible on race. They were terrible on money. And he sits down. The thunder was silence because people were by now very depressed. I promise to send you home a little more. <laughs> um, um, the, the second, um, um, Brennan stands up. Brennan said, Felix, as, as usual, you've done beautifully, but aren't you forgetting something? We've had 50 years of magnificent jurisprudence by the Supreme Court in case after case that has swept away every formal impediment to voting and running for office and fair representation that plagued American democracy for 180 years. For 180 years, during what I call the hands-off policy, um, you, people couldn't vote, they couldn't run for office, um, uh, representation, was, there was a minefield of rules that said that you couldn't do it. What Brennan did by put, bringing equality into the process is that he jump-started this wonderful intellectual idea, and it's a simple idea. Brennan said, if anybody can vote, if there's one person who's allowed to vote, then everybody else has to be allowed to vote, unless you can show me some overwhelming reason why the person is being treated in a discriminatory way. That simple idea filled the void in the Constitution. One of the embarrassing voids in the American Constitution is that it says nothing about the right to vote, nothing about the right to run for office, nothing about democracy at all. The great blueprint, the first great blueprint in the Western world for democratic governance forgot about democracy. It has nothing in there about democracy, in large part because it couldn't say anything that even smacked of having to talk about equality because of the pact with the devil we made about slavery so that you couldn't really talk about anything important about equality in the text of the Constitution. So voting and running for office and all of those things get left out. Brennan puts it back in. He figures out a way to get it back in. And in the 50 years since Brennan figured that out, every impediment to voting has been swept away. There was a constitutional right to vote. There was a constitutional right to run for office. Property qualifications have been swept away. Duration and residence requirements have been swept away. One person, one vote is ascendant and triumphant everywhere. It works, and we have at least uh, equipopulous representation. Um, uh, you, you, the, the answer is, would the populace, would, would the people, if they didn't do it for the first 180 years, would they have fixed it in the last 50? The answer is no. So that Brennan has, on his side, I've committed the judiciary. And the judiciary did wonderful things. Did he do perfect things? No. Frankfurter's opinions are all, you know, are all there. He said they're all five to four losses. Every one of them is five, are five to four losses. Um, and I feel those losses keenly. But Brennan said, do you think that it would be better if we didn't do anything at all? If we still had impediments on the right to vote, still had impediments on the right to run for office, still had um, a, 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 a malapportioned legislatures, still had no protection for third party candidates, which is what the, uh, the rule was before Brennan. So then Harley stands up and in characteristic, mod characteristically modest ways, comes and says, well, I guess you're right, Bill. I guess uh, equality helped a lot, but the problem is the problem that I identified 47 years ago. And that's that without a theory of democracy, without a gyroscope that tells you why you care about these cases, why you've committed the Supreme Court in order to protect democracy, without having some conception of what the democracy is, what you do is you launch a jurisprudence where judges in hard cases think about formal rules. Does it violate the Equal Protection does it violate the First Amendment? Does it violate separation of powers? Does it violate federalism? How do I read the text of this statute? Do I read the text of this statute this way or that way, according to whatever formal rule I have for construction? And nobody asks the central question, the central holistic question, is this good or bad for democracy? And so what we wind up with is a jurisprudence of democracy that is accidental. 
the accidental interplay of how the First Amendment and equality and all of these other perfectly wonderful norms get used, but because there's no theory of democracy backstopping it, no justice is saying, is this good or bad for democracy? Um, and so you wind up, for example, with a case like Bush versus Gore. Bush versus Gore is the classic formalist case, where you make a strong formal argument that there was inequality in the standards being used to count the ballots to, um, um, in Florida. And that's, a, that's an equality problem. If one person's vote gets counted, other people's vote should get counted on the same terms. So there is a formal equality problem. So in order to save that formal equality problem, five members of the Supreme Court sacrificed the entire election. That's, that's, the, that's the classic problem of formalism. In order to save the formal village, you destroy the substance of the village. And the whole reason for having the formal equality in the first place was to build a vibrant, substantive, democratic village. Um, now, I could take you through each of Frankfurter's cases, and I think demonstrate the same thing. But formally, they're fine. But democratically, they're devastating. <coughs> and so that you wind up with democratic, debilitating decisions that are correct formally, but terrible for democracy, because there's no standard, there's no democratic standard that we're using as a people or a reviewing court to measure whether these decisions are right or wrong. Citizens, Citizens United is exactly the case. Citizens United may be perfectly good First Amendment law, but it blows up the democracy. It is terrible for democracy. But until we have a democratic theory on this side, all you have is a First Amendment theory on this side, and no powerful democratic theory on the other. Let me take the next five or 10 minutes to sketch for you. It's not too late to listen to Harlan. It is not too late to say, no, he was right. We need, in order to make our democracy jurisprudence work, we need to adopt some theory of democracy that will tell us how to operate. And what's the, what's the roadmap to get there? How might we get there? Let me suggest that we get there by taking a look at why First Amendment jurisprudence is so powerful. Because two years after Baker versus Carr, in Times v. Sullivan, Brennan, writing again for the court, constitutionalized the law of libel in order to protect speech. Um, now, that's a hard case. Times v. Sullivan is a very hard case. In order to make it win, Brennan sold the court on a theory of the First Amendment. There's lots of theories of why we have the First Amendment. We might have the First Amendment because of autonomy. We might have the First Amendment because of a fear of government. There's lots of reasons why we have the First Amendment. Brennan sold the court that we have a First Amendment in order to have a marketplace of ideas. But that's really what the First Amendment is about, um, of keeping an open marketplace of ideas. And the Supreme Court bought into the theory not just the formal protection of the First Amendment, but the theory underlying it, bought into the theory, and for the next 46 years has ruthlessly enforced it, so that you get the best First Amendment jurisprudence you could possibly hope for, um, because it's rooted in deep theory, and the court knows the model, it knows how to test every argument against whether it's good or bad for the free market and ideas model. That's what we have to do for democracy. We have to invest democracy with the kind of model um, that the court used in, the, in, in times we saw them. If they have a model of democracy against which to measure, then, that, then they will have the kind of gyroscope that they have in First Amendment cases to say that I'm going to continually decide these cases to enhance democracy, not to harm it. And you begin to get a very, very different looking jurisprudence. And we're halfway there. We're halfway there, because if you take a very careful look at First Amendment jurisprudence, you find that there's no such thing as the First Amendment. There are First Amendments. The First Amendment is relentlessly contextual. It operates in context after context to make sure that whatever context it operates in, that context operates effectively as a free market and ideas. So for example, in the legislature, Nobody would suggest that you can buy time on the floor of the legislature. Nobody would suggest that the First Amendment guarantees you the right to drown out your opponents, or that the First Amendment in some way 
uh, renders it impossible to have orderly legislative debate. Any of you who are as wonky as I am and who watched the healthcare debate in the House of Representatives, wasn't it astonishing to see people stand up and say, um, uh, the representative from South Carolina has 45 seconds? Um, and you had to make your case in 45 seconds because there was a careful time rule to allow everybody to have a say and then to vote with a population that had heard everything that anybody wanted to say and then made the vote. Same thing in court. People imagine if we sold the right to speak in court, um, uh, if the guy with the richest amount of money got to talk longer than the person who couldn't have afforded it. Now we have some of that now because of the uh, fact that we don't have a system in which everybody gets adequate counsel. And that's, a, that's one of the disgraces and shames of our system. But the model is that, that would be a terrible thing to do, to sell that kind of time and to allow money to decide how, uh, how much a judge can hear it. Erwin um, uh, was kind enough to mention the Velasquez case that I argued some years ago. That's exactly what I told the Supreme Court. The, Supreme, the, the Congress had made it, made it unlawful for legal services lawyers to make certain arguments in court. Why? Because the government gave them money, and therefore the government was entitled to tell them what they could say. I said that was completely inconsistent with the market in ideas that existed in a courtroom. A judge needed all the arguments, all the information, or else the adversary model couldn't work. And the Supreme Court agreed and invalidated. It's one of the only invalidations of a subsidy uh, that you'll ever see. And it's because of the subsidy got in the way of the of optimal operation of the judicial process. You could, we can, you can take that through the uh, um, uh, uh, context after context. Um, a classroom. You think a classroom will pay to let somebody spend more time taking their exams than somebody else? Um, that's speech. But of course we understand that there are restrictions on it in order to make that context work and work in an optimum way. Now, the other side of the coin as well, in prisons, in schools, in the military, you get less free speech rights because they're worried about interfering with the context, interfering with the operation of the institution. What I'm going to suggest to you is that there's a context that we've forgotten, and the context is called an election. There is absolutely no reason why the idea of an election can't be analogized to the idea of a legislative session courtroom, of a classroom, of any of the many, many contextual uh, areas in which the court has been subtle um, and brilliant in its First Amendment jurisprudence, we're already almost there because we recognize elections as what I call bounded spheres. We recognize them as a bounded sphere within which regulation can take place. The very fact that we have what we call the Australian ballot. And then if you want to run for office, you can't just go down and say, I'd like to run for office. You have to qualify for the ballot. Why? Because the election is a special thing. And we need to limit the number of candidates so it can work effectively. Um, um, we, we, uh, we won't allow third parties, for example, to cross endorse in 41 states. Why? Because we're afraid that the cross endorsements will confuse the voters um, and will interfere with the fair administration of the process. We won't allow people, uh, there's no constitutional right to a write-in ballot. Why? Because write-in ballots might screw up the election. Um, you can't um, electioneer near the polls, 100 feet from the polls. That's been upheld by the Supreme Court. Why? Because you don't want to screw up the election. Well, if that's the case, if they've already recognized an election as a bounded sphere within which regulations of free speech activities can take place that could never take place outside of that bounded sphere. If they've already regulated it, uh, recognized it as a bounded sphere, it's a very small jump to say. And that bounded sphere also prevents somebody with a megaphone or a microphone or a loudspeaker from standing out there and drowning out everybody else's speech in the period just before the election. And so it, it, the modest, my modest proposal is to say to the Supreme Court, hey, adopt, adopt the model of democracy. Democracy is all about choice. It's all about the ability of autonomous voters to make an autonomous decision about who they want to govern them. In order to make sure that that decision is truly autonomous, you can't let one side drown out the other side so that the voters will at least have all of the information 
in a, and I'm not talking about equality here, I'm talking about um, not allowing one side to really drown out the other side, I'm not suggesting that it has to be equally funded. I'm just suggesting that where the disproportionate funding is risks being so overwhelming that it is okay for us to step in and regulate it the way we would regulate a courtroom, a classroom, the legislature, um, any other institution we care about. And so that's the way forward. The way forward is to recognize that Harlan was right 47 years ago, that Brennan has had an amazing run with his equality jurisprudence, but we've run out of formal solutions. Uh, we now need to go to a substantive understanding of what it means to hold a real election in a real substantive functioning democracy. And the first step is to overrule Citizens United. Thank you. I would uh, love to take questions. Um, if I can't answer them, I will ask you a question back. That's, uh, what, I do with, that's what I do with my law school classroom. When any student stumps me, I always ask them a question back. So they know that they, when, I, when that happens, they're so happy. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be the first guinea pig. Um, the Citizens United, uh, like all these great cases, was a 5 4 a vote. Yeah. And, you say you have a path and you have Harlan's uh, concept, but you know how are you going to get a 5-4 vote the other way? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let, me, let me answer that facetiously and, and really. The facetious answer is that in 1988, I was a member of the first American delegation that went to Moscow to talk to, this was during the Gorbachev um, um, uh, Glasnost era, to talk to the Soviets about rule of law. We would have a conference on the, rule, on the rule of law. And I debated the Deputy Minister of Justice. And so, he, and so he stands up and he says, Oh, Mr. Newborn's going to tell you that they have a real democracy in the United States. Well, I just looked at the numbers, and the numbers are that um, um, there's a 98% re election rate in the House of Representatives. Some years it's 99%. He said, that looks to me like a self-perpetuating oligarchy, if I ever saw one. He said, in our country, in the polar bureau, in the polar bureau, we have a 25% turnover every year. So he said, so who has more democracy? We have, uh, we have more democracy than the West, and we shouldn't take